awesome to welcome Seattle Storm head coach Noel Quinn to the basketball podcast. Quinn joined the Storm coaching staff in 2019 following her first championship as a player in 2018 with the Storm. Quinn has won a WNBA championship as a player and as a coach and has also been recently named an assistant coach with the Canadian women's national basketball team, as well as previously serving as the head coach of the girls basketball team at Bishop Montgomery High School during the WNBA offseason. Coach Quinn, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Thank you for having me. This is going to be exciting and uh, so many things to talk about. I want to start with the one which is uh, maybe most obvious and maybe the biggest challenges for you transitioning from a player to a coach. Well, you know, it's it's very interesting because uh, when I was a player, I had the feedback from a lot of coaches that I play the game like a coach. And so, you know, the interesting part about my journey as a coach is like, I didn't really see it, but others, see it, others saw it within me. And so I think the biggest challenge I think is the way in which you look at the game, right? So as a player, my preparation was looking at a scout. Um, okay, this player goes left this many times, I take them out off of their sweet spot, what plays do the team like to run? I'm trying to get signals so that I, I'm telling the team like what to look for in advance. And just, you know, things from that uh, standpoint of strategy. But as a coach, what I've, you know, learned is that the, the game becomes looking at it in like more analytics and numbers. Also with the eye test as well. I think that was kind of the biggest challenge is kind of switching gears and how I approach um, my strategy. Um, and that is maybe understanding why a team is so successful through numbers as opposed to the feel of a player. And I think the other biggest adjustment I would say is just um, I'm naturally a, a quiet leader, um, quiet person, quiet demeanor. And now it is about coming out of that shell in a way that I, I mean, the, the cerebral part of it, the IQ is hoops is hoops. I love it. But now it's how do I put, package everything together and be a strong, firm leader with a strong, dominant voice? Not anything out of my character, just a little bit different for me. Well, thank you for sharing that introspection. I mean, that, it's going to be curious to ask you some follow-up questions in a few years and see where you are with that. And, and maybe with that, then, what type of appreciation have you gained for coaching that upon reflection, you wish maybe you had had as a player? I mean, sleepless nights. <laughs> Easier to go to sleep as a player, you're saying. Yeah, you're right. You know what I mean? You have to, you know, but I think you, you just, you, you don't really understand. I think as a player, you're so engrossed into your craft and the game, the team winning games, and that you forget that a coach is in their own element and their own grind as well. Um, watching film, watching multiple games, um, coming up with strategy, looking at, you know, think, thinking about the players all the time. Like you, your brain never turns off on how to be better as a coach, how to make your team better. What could we have done better as a unit? And I think as a player, you appreciate your coaches, but there's just a, a level of appreciation that I now have for, you know, the, the details about every single day, going I and mean, planning the entire season from a, physical standpoint of practice or so we're practicing games we can't you know practice too hard this day like there's so many intricate details that I don't think players really kind of understand that goes into you know the overall success of our um, program well and and with that obviously the difference between focusing on just one person yourself and now having to worry about a whole roster and a staff and everyone else that goes around the program as well absolutely and it is for me, it's a great learning process. It's a great experience to know. I I like to operate from a heart space. So people is kind of like my thing. I like to interact. So I have such a quiet demeanor. I, I make sure I have connections with everyone. And so I think, you know, understanding that management part of it is that good quality of me of just making sure everyone is just okay as a human being first. And then, you know, making sure we are on point as a unit when it comes to whatever we may need for our entire group, you know? So talk to us more. I'm fascinated to use that word about uh, your heart and heart space. Uh, I'm big into heart math and that's your heart's intuition and your heart has intelligence and power. So talk to me a little bit about what that means for you. Yeah, for me, it's just, I think 
it, it's important to understand like we're we're here in this hopefully hundred years of life to be like a light to other people. We're here to have some type of impact. It's not only for us, you know, it's not just, you know, we're here to just work and get money and it, all that. Life. That's not what life is about, in my opinion. So when I think about, for me, what heart space is for me is when I come into an environment, when I come into contact with someone, when I cross paths with someone, I want that person to leave better being in my presence in my space because I've enlightened them I've empowered them I've brightened their day I think my purpose in life is to be a light to others hands down I want to live in that purpose every single day and I think I, I'm most fulfilled when I'm serving that and you know I'm, I, I've said this before I'm not of this world like the things of the world kind of don't move me to act a certain way it is how I treat people it is how people respond to me it is how I can encourage somebody. It is how I can make somebody's life better. And so that that's what that means to me. I love that. You and I could have some real deep conversation uh, on all of that. And that's awesome to hear. And uh, no doubt that, that that guides how you lead. You know, the other thing you mentioned that, that some of your coaches said that you would be a great coach because you were a coach on the floor. Well, something else that you did very proactively is that you went back during the WNBA off seasons and you coached high school basketball. And I've got to think that's got to be a huge influence on how you've developed your philosophy as a coach because you got a chance to try things, didn't you? Absolutely. And, you know, I started coaching high school when I was still playing in the W. So in the off season, I uh, had, again, an another opportunity from my, my former principal who saw that within me. And I, I was able to, I think, create um, a space, a lane for myself. Like, this is the type of coach that I want to be. Um, obviously, coaching at my alma mater, like the kids can see my jerseys, they can see my banners and all those things. That helped <laughs> a lot. Um, but understanding that, you know, I, I was I was coaching them like pros in a way as far as just like I'm giving them the best of the best. Like, I don't care if you think this is high school, this is too hard. I set the standard high, the bar high, and they rose up to that standard. Like, I didn't say this is too hard for them. I'm not going to teach them. And I think that kind of um, amped them up to just want to be better for me, be better for themselves and for the team. And you see the the for me, it wasn't. The success in high school basketball isn't the wins, wasn't the wins more so than the young ladies leaving senior year and, and getting better and, and learning and growing. And I think every day I had a responsibility to be a, a mentor to them, a, a great example for them, a confident, a disciplinary, sometimes a, a big sis to them. Like I had that responsibility every day. And so, and then the basketball was the icing on the cake. And so when we talk, you know, strategy and what we did on the floor, I think there was so much like buy-in because I just wanted to make sure they were great human beings first and foremost. How are your grades? How are your family? All right, let's get to the hoop talk next. And I think that really helped. And obviously got to a running pro sets in high school basketball, like, you know, doing fun stuff that people probably wouldn't do in high school. But I think we've had a good time. We were successful with it. Well, I want to connect that for some of the coaches listening, because Ronald Norad, who's now an assistant with the Indiana Pacers, he talked about the same thing. He And he had a great experience playing at Butler, obviously, and uh, playing professionally. And he talked about coach them like pros in the high school level. And he coached high school first, exactly what you're saying. And the mindset that comes back is coaching them with respect, but also, as you said, with expectations. And I just love that connection. Exactly. And I, I think I think my other goal was, no, not I think, I know. My other goal was I wanted them to, you know, you, you have all type of athletes in high school. Some will go division one, division two, JUCO. Some will never play basketball ever again in their life. But what I wanted to do was make sure the student athletes who went to college, they got to college and knew everything in, in as far as verbiage and, you know, verbiage does change a little bit when you get to college, but every single detail about basketball, you've learned it from me. So you don't get to college and, and your coach says, you never learned that in high school? Like that, that was the bar that I was setting. And it, it could have been a player who will never see the, the a floor after their four years with me, but they will know how to lock and trail. Like they will know concepts about basketball that I feel like is important as a student of the game. 
Well, and you talked about that's your greater purpose. And if you were just looking from a basketball perspective, it's to prepare them to be a lifelong fan of the game, a lifelong understanding of the game. But also if they go up to their next level, they are prepared. Even if those some of those things don't necessarily help you win high school games, it prepares them beyond that, doesn't it? Absolutely. I got a chance to talk to two of your future assistant coaches with the Canadian national team, Steve Bauer and Car- Carly Clark, uh, great coaches. You can have a great time interacting with them. And both of them alluded to this question, which is how do you manage coaching players you just played with? <laughs> you know, I honestly think that it was um, for my benefit to have played with Sue, played with Jewel, played with Stewie, at, at one point played with Alicia Clark, Epiphany Prince, like Jordan Canada. I'm trying to think of the names. I don't want to forget anyone. It helped me because, um, you know, those were kind of my later years of my career. So as a vet with that team playing for them, I'm already kind of instilling values within them that, you know, as a vet, you, you, you talk with your teammates, but also the rapport that we had, like those are really genuinely my friends. I care about them. I think them having so much faith in me and like encouraging me and confidence in me stem from how I approached myself as a player, how professional I was, um, how I would help them as a player, how I would listen to them, how I would try to guide them in the way. And those aspects of of me, I am who I am. And so naturally transitioning into coaching, it was already set up because that's how um, teammate relationship was already. Now coaching them, I always joke like I'm coaching my homies. Like it is it is a balance. Like I can't go hang out with them as much anymore, right? I'm not in a locker room with them. I don't know the inside jokes anymore, but I care about them. They care about me. They want me to be great. They they want to be great for me and I want to be great for them. I don't know if I, if I go to another organization and I have the same effect because they know me. And because of that, because of the, the history that we had, we were in the trenches, of the trenches together, we won a championship together, had some had a bad season together. We, we went through so much together that brings you close, close that bonds you for forever. And I think now in this next journey for me, they just want to see me excel and as do I with them. And it's just a natural, honest, organic relationship. Now, is it hard? Yeah, because I think, you know, you want to have a balance of like the coach. At some point, you guys are the players. I got you. You know what I mean? But after we're done with practice, I'm back to your home. You know, you know what I mean? Like finding that totally. good balance, you know, it, 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 I'm, I'm navigating that. They're, they're amazing. And they, they help me to feel the confidence that I need to just coach them. Well, and you've said this a number of times to be yourself. And, and the reality is you have to embrace this reality instead of try and say, this doesn't exist. This is, this is actually what it was. And a few years ago, you played with them and now I'm coaching them. So let's get into the nitty gritty a little bit. Sue Bird, and I can't imagine this ever happens, but say she doesn't meet your expectations. How are you holding her accountable? <laughs> <laughs> it's easy to hold the team accountable or anyone accountable when your superstars hold themselves accountable. Mm-hmm. You know, and I think, you know, there are, I, I've, I've played for Sue for a number of years overseas. I played, you know, like when in Seattle when we weren't so good when we kind of started cooking up and, and good. So I've seen her, even her elevation as a leader, you know, and, and her, and her evolution and she's still continuing to get better. I just strongly feel like our culture and what we built our organization to be, it allows the players to play, the coaches to coach, but also there is this standard that if your best players are your hardest workers, then it's easier for me. So, I mean, when you say hold her accountable, they hold themselves accountable. It is now like, how can we get better? Like, how can we continue to evolve? You know, we weren't so good right here. It it becomes more strategy than having to manage something that's like innate in them you know i'm not gonna hold you i'm not gonna front it's tough like you don't she's the she's the best point guard to ever play our game and so sometimes you kind of think about the ways in which you want to approach situations but that's what sue does she she elevates the level of play for everyone the, the level of your mind you're thinking for everyone and so you you have to walk into the gym ready to go knowing what's going on being prepared and 
because she has that expectation for herself, then everybody else has that expectation as well. So it makes it easier. And, and you think back to your time as a player, you definitely had times where you disagreed with the coach and you have current players on your roster that have disagreed with you. And then I'm wondering, like to a certain extent, coaching is a democracy at the highest level. We want it to be, but sometimes it's not. And you have to say, this is the way we're doing it. So I'm wondering if you have a unique perspective on that from obviously being a player and now moving into this role, coaching, you know, really high level players. Yes, I do. I think, you know, early on as a coach, I, I've just, you know, I'm only a few years removed from playing. So one thing that I do try to remember is what did I like as a player? Like, what do we feel as a group? What were we talking about in a locker room when situations arise? So my ego is not big. If there's something, I'm always going to sue. Like, you see something, you want to run something. And then, you know, we kind of, we always had that open dialogue because you want to be on the same page. You want it, you want it to be an extension of the coach, everything. Uh, from, you talk about their point guard, point guard being an extension, but also you want your whole group to be an extension of what we do on a daily basis. I just have open dialogue. You can't, you can't, it's not a dictatorship as a pro. You know, it's different in college, different in high school. I, what I say goes and no, you know, but at some point, players are on the court. They have a feel for something and they see things a little bit differently than you are sitting on the on the bench. And you have to be open to that and understand it's like it's not any no no knock against you. It's not that you you didn't know it, but it's what they feel. And you have to trust that. Trust their gut. And the other thing, um, just recently I was able to talk with Coach Steve Kerr, and he has a very good presence, calm, quiet presence about himself, but he did relay that with him and Draymond, sometimes he has to kind of buck up a little bit. And But I think there is a respect level there. It's not anything negative. It's that just that, you know, you got to buck back so that the player knows that um, you're not going to back down. Like you're you're not a punk in any way. Luckily, I haven't had to, have <laughs> to do that quite yet. But just having that knowledge to know that it's okay at times to have situations that may not always feel the right way to respond in that moment. But as long as the, the goal is always the goal, the plan is always the plan, the commonality of everything is always the same, then we're good. It is It becomes a dialogue, a conversation more than anything different than that. Yeah, somebody phrased it to me once that uh, you have some people that respond to your humanity and you have some people that respond to your strength. And it's a balance with all of that. And that's basically what you're describing. And I'm so glad we're having this conversation because you have such a unique perspective on all these things. The other one that goes with it is I imagine with what your leadership style you described is, and also as a former player, you value empowering your players. You, you don't, you don't want to control them. You want to give them freedom to be able to make decisions, et cetera. So can you talk about that with the balance of obviously having to hold them accountable to running the play or running the situation that you want. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I think like you talked about, there's a strength in, in, in the leadership, that quality that needs to happen. If you feel, you know, at the, in, the, in the same token, sometimes as coaches, you see something a little bit different that they didn't see quite there that they can't adjust to. So i got the play call right now. You know, I think that especially having, having Sue on your team, she's a, a coach, honestly. She's a player coach. And so um, there is a connection that we have. I let her roll. You know, she's play calling or whatever, but sometimes she'll look over like you got something or, you know, I, I give that freedom because like I said, coaches, sometimes we get in the way. And I, and I think sometimes you have to just, and I, I bring up this word again, like our egos, you know, don't have an ego. It's okay. It's it's okay to to let them lead in a way and to empower that leadership because at the end of the day, we all trust each other. At the end of the day, we're all trying to win the game. It's not that we're point shaving in a way, <laughs> you know, we're all trying to get there. And it's, it's maybe we have different means of getting there, but we're going to get there and we're going to get there together in a way. So again, I think, you know, I also like to empower my staff, people around me. I, I don't I don't like to for people to think they can't have an idea or say anything or suggest anything. I'm open. I'm so collaborative. I pride myself in being the ultimate teammate. I said that as a teammate. I will continue to say that as a coach. And that goes with how you control your team, how you coach your team, how you manage your team. I'm always so quick to say, hey, what did you see? How do you feel? You want to do this? That, you know, and, and just have everything and, and be ready and be prepared. And I think I found some success in it so far. 
I mean this question as a as as uh, I guess non confrontational, but I want to bring it up because we had very similar starts to our careers in a sense that both of us coached very talented teams to start with, from your high school to the Seattle Storm. And I had a great mentor of mine say to me once, which I found very true when I finally was in that spot. You really start to become the next level coach that you're going to be when you coach a less talented roster and have to figure it out. And I'm imagining to a certain extent, you're excited to do that, to prove again, that you can, without Sue Bird, without whoever it's going to be, that you can figure it out. Is that part of your mindset? It is. You know, you think about us, our organization, our trajectory. I, I got to shout out Jenny Busick. She's, she created, created our systems that we have now been success, successful in. She planted those seeds and I played for her and she's now coaching in the NBA, but I, I learned so much from her and just continue to try to incorporate her, her values, her goals into our strategies, you know, our philosophies and all those things. And so a part of me that does feel like this is still very much her, but my goal right now with New York, because we've been successful, what she, she's imparted, what's our evolution? How, how can we get better? How can we improve? How, what do we look like moving forward? You know, going through free agency with new players, a new roster, our superstars are in their prime. You know, this is a, a great time for them. Our, our leader is, you know, kind of exiting and, and transitioning herself. So for me, the challenge becomes like, how, what's my footprint? Like, what's my legacy on the organization at this moment? And I think it is to continue to be successful. I don't want to <laughs> taint it in any way. But, but it I, is motivational for you, isn't it? For motivational because, again, it challenges me. What's the next level? I'm, I'm watching games constantly, writing notes constantly, like preparing constantly because now I got to be the best version of myself. As I know, this is really bad to say, but I'm sure people are doubting me. I'm sure there are some haters and I don't operate in that. I don't pay attention to that, but it's the reality of the situation. And I, I just want to make sure that I just do honor to the people who have paved the way for me to be here and have this opportunity, but also for people to know I'm equipped for it. I, there, there's no mistake in, in having me in this position. I'm built for it too. That is who I am. Um, that is a challenge, but I, I'm, I'm like empowered in that. I, I love that. Yeah. And, and the haters don't fit in heart space. So I, I know you don't buy into that. Hey, and, and the other thing is like when my mentor told me that it, it was very, it was very inspirational to further my learning and challenge myself more and not to be complacent, right. knowing that these challenges were coming. And that's what I think all great coaches and all great leaders do is they reach beyond their current level because they know things are coming that are going to challenge them. Absolutely. We as coaches, Talk about players in the off season getting better. You got to come back better, come back with the, something different, come back with an improved jump shot, whatever it is. Like, what are we as coaches improving on? What are we coming back from after the off season with? What have we gotten better with? And I think we have to continue to evolve. Using your expertise, player, coach, transition. What are some of the most common chemistry disruptors from within the team? And you've experienced this from both ends. Yeah. I think as a player, I have 12 different personalities. And so it, it becomes, you know, how do we coexist with everyone's differences? How can we find some commonality in our differences? You know, this person likes to hang out a little bit. This person is kind of quiet. But once we were, um, I use Seattle as a reference, once we got past all of that, like our bonds became unbreakable. And I'm not saying everyone was the best of friends, but we genuinely cared for one another. And sometimes in the league, it doesn't allow teams and people to do that. Sometimes it actually does because a lot of us play overseas together. But I think the challenge, you know, one chemistry breaker can be just, you know, a poor attitude or a cancerous person or a person who is not all the way bought in or always, you know, disruptive in a way of like always, you know, negative about things like negative Nancy's all the time. And that this is probably like a very simple example, but that can really affect how your team um, excels because you know how cancer is like when it starts to grow, 
comes becomes bigger and bigger, and all of a sudden your entire team is engulfed in that. I would say from a player standpoint, just being in locker rooms with players who aren't feeling the situation, whether it's not the playing time or the money, whatever it is, I think that that's kind of the biggest one in, in a locker room. So Honestly, on the flip on the side, board, what, would, what can enhance chemistry then? Again, a very simple example, but being committed and intentional about getting to know each other outside of basketball. So whether it's going to dinner after a game, whether it's going to play cards or, you know, setting up a brunch time or doing community service together. And it doesn't have to be all 12, but at some point it has to be the group. At some point, you know what else helps? Group text, <laughs> you know, like just, you know, having inside jokes and things like that. Because when you understand who you're sitting next to on a day-to-day -day basis, you just have a deeper appreciation for what you guys are doing together. So I'm going hard. I'm going to take this charge for you. I'm going to go my hardest for you because I care about you and I want to be successful with you, alongside of you. And it is because at the card table, I learned a little bit about you last night. I learned about your struggle. I learned about your successes. I learned what helps you. And when you are, in, again, engaged and intentional about understanding that the better we are as a unit chemistry wise and, uh, and knowing who we are the better we're going to be on the floor and again I'm not saying you have to be the best of best because I've heard stories of players who hated each other off the court didn't get along with each other off the court but had that common like competitive spirit on the court to win and it worked but for my examples I think what works is what you do outside of the basketball court so the Seattle Storm group text uh, is there a team one? And is there one where the coaches are on with the team too? Yeah, there was like multiple groups. Yeah. Um, I'll just, I'll just <laughs> one say without I'll... the coaches, one with the coaches. <laughs> exactly, exactly. <laughs> that's great. I think that's pretty common nowadays, which is awesome to hear it happens at yeah. that level as well. Uh, I, I'd love to hear your answer on this because you, you've shaped a little bit of who you are for us. And, and I believe I know the answer a little bit, but maybe more focus on the how. A player, a newcomer comes onto your roster or a young player comes into your team and you're trying to develop them as a leader. It might not necessarily be their personality, as you alluded to a little bit with yourself. And how do you bring that out for them and help them do what coaches have done for you? Yeah, I mean, the first thing that that comes to mind is when you're when you're again, I'll say it, when your best player is your hardest worker, everything else falls in mind. So from a professionalism standpoint. When you have veterans and players who are very, very, very sharp in their approach, that's the first thing I'll say to a young player. Hey, watch this player. You see this person come to the gym this early? Like, you need to be here earlier than them. You need to stay after. Let's watch film together. Just, you, you need to show up on time. You need to ask questions if you don't know. All of these little details that sometimes um, young athletes come into a situation and don't really know, I kind of point them in the direction of who they, who they should be modeling themselves after in that standpoint. And then when you talk through, when you talk about just X's and O's and, you know, how they fit in the system, you know, you want young players to be themselves. But what I've learned is that there are there is a, a learning curve that has to occur. Like there, it's rare to come into our league and just settle into a position and just feel, you know, dominate how you were in college. It's rare. But you know the rarity of that. The, the players who have done that, you, you know what type of players those are. And so with younger players, I think just understanding there is a, a, a trajectory and there is a, a steady climb to where you want to be. It's not going to all happen on day one and it's not going to all happen in training camp you are going to hit a rookie wall, like straight up. Like you've been playing college basketball all year, got drafted, coming to W, you are going to get tired. You're going to get frustrated. It's going to, your mental fatigue is going to set in. It's going to happen. It's happened to all of us. But what is going to push you through those moments is your preparation as a professional. And that that starts day one when you walk into the gym. And, and I try to just take, as a vet player, I just try to, like, I'll just use Jordan Canada was one example for me, just as, you know, she was coming in as a rookie year, you know, a, a huge role for us, a backup point guard off the bench, and I just always constantly try to pour into her, talk to her, tell her when she was great, tell her when she wasn't so great. Just learning that generation of, of how to communicate kind of really helped me along the way with now the information I learned to how to communicate to these younger generation of players and um, just understanding like, look, trust the process, you know, don't rush it, um, take your time, but put the work in, 
don't not do that on a day-to-day -day basis. It's great stuff. And uh, coach, I want to get into some X's and O's a little bit with you too, and talk a little bit of offense. I, I know during that, uh, the year when you became a, a, you know, associate head coach and the different the transitions from Dan Hughes, you know, Gary Kloppenberg handled the defense, you handled the offense and what success that was uh, getting into some of the offensive stuff, uh, because I got to do a little bit of a deep dive on what you guys were doing and some of the things that stood out for me. So maybe if you can comment a little bit on, uh, you know, the philosophy behind some of the things you do. First of all, grenades, dribble handoffs out of the post. I was really impressed with some of the variability and some of the different ways that you guys ran grenades out of the post. So can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I think one one thing to think about DHLs, they're very hard to defend, you know, so there are multiple things that you can do if you do, utilize that concept. If teams go under, you can rescreen. You know, Ezzy uh, does an amazing job of faking those DHOs. And so there are a variety of different things that you can do. You know, when we, we go into the post and we come out of the post, we call that an uphill DHO. You know, that 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 works as well. So I think just having a, a variety of ways to move the ball around. That's one of our philosophies. We don't like the ball to stick. We like to play with pace. We like to have, a, you know, we call it flow offensively we don't I don't I don't know if I'm giving too much detail but no get into detail coach <laughs> okay. everyone everyone wants a detail <laughs> okay um you know offensively you have to think about you you have play calls and you have sets and you have structure and you have spacing what's what we do as a unit is what we're successful at and what makes us so great in my opinion is what we do after that like everybody knows everybody's played everybody knows where the ball is going to but what becomes unscoutable is our movement, our spacing, our pace, our um, variety of actions after the entry. So we like to just continue to space, move, cut, pass the ball. And I think that's really, really worked for us. But yeah, DHOs have become heavy in our system. And I think it kind of opens up the floor, opens up spacing for our playmakers to play, um, to turn the corner and, and create for themselves and for others. You already mentioned another characteristic, which is fake handoffs. Wow, you guys are so effective at fake handoffs. And I'm wondering, what is the balance? Are, are some de by design and some are, are are just reads and decisions or are they all reads and decisions? Definitely. You yeah. know, again, we talked about that freedom, right, for the players to have. Like, yeah, if, if we call a set and we're trying to get a DHO, but you're reading that your player is about to switch or, you know, jumping the, the DHO, yeah, go ahead and turn the corner and feel that. We have obviously amazing players and we allow them to make those reads for themselves. And, and yeah, we'll set some things up for them to actually, you know, for it, for it to actually occur. And some of that is just reads. And again, our flow is the freedom to read, to move, to react. You don't want to box the players in. You don't want to just, you know, train track them. This is how it's supposed to be. And again, it just, it's hel it helps everyone to get involved, helps to keep that ball moving. And it's fun, you know? Fake handoff decisions. Then some of the cue, some of the things that cue it. You talked about the switch. Uh, what else are some of the cues that would lead to a fake handoff? Yeah, I think one thing you have to think about is the momentum and pace that occurs and how you get the ball into that next action of a fake handoff. So, a lot of times it feels like a DHO is a little bit better in some action to fake it because the ball has moved right from side to side. Now the defense has shifted. shifted. The next action is coming with pace. Now the defense has more chance to to mess up, you know, as opposed to just stagnant DHO fake. I think we we use a lot of just stand still fake DHOs probably more in the game, ATO, you know, so something that doesn't, it's just pretty kind of quick triggered. And, you know, a couple of sets that we have out of our, our horn set at the elbow that, you know, can can create a fake handoff situation to ISO. A lot of those things are, you know, your, your standstill fake handoff is more of like a, a, a standstill steady offense of let's get this, this read the DHO fake handoff becomes a space and pace um, to get the defense to mess up. Yeah. And there's enough variability from watching you guys that it would be really hard to ever figure out when you're doing what, yeah. <laughs> which is part of the point of what you talked about in terms of flow and uh, the freedom a little bit. Uh, another concept uh, with the spacing and you kind of already alluded to this is a, a lot of actions, especially ball screens to the open side, the open side, I call open ball screens where there's no one in the corner. 
you know, there's say three spaced on the weak side somehow, and a lot of action towards that open side. Curious what the philosophy is behind that. Yeah, um, so a couple of things come to mind. When we're, when we have open side ball screens, um, you think about Stewie and her versatility, and you just want to give the, your playmaker, your ball handler some space, but you also want to give Stewie space to operate. So, you know, we all know Stewie likes to pick and pop, but there are times now teams are switching, right? Easily just switching, um, are, are, are switching more often on Stewie to take away her three. Now, what we found is with the open space, ball screen, she can, she doesn't have to necessarily go all the way to the block to get the mismatch. She just posts up at the elbow, like Dirk, like, and, and get a, and, you know, face up and get her match up that way. But also if we give her an opportunity to give it back to her, there's just more space for her to operate in that way. She doesn't like it, snaps it right back, goes into a, a step up or another ball screen. And now we're just moving and, and, and spacing in that way. Another way we like to run ball screen is actually having someone in that corner. So going toward the two side, because it creates what we talk, what we call a one man eye. So as we come off the ball screen from that side, going toward the two man side, now we put the corner defender in a dilemma. Do I take the roller or do I stay with the shooter? And so we like to run a lot of actions to get us into that situation to create mismatches or to create defensive, I guess, situations for, for the defense to decide, do I want to, you know, take Mercedes on the dive? Do I, do I, do I want to guard the rim? Or do I want to leave Steph Talbot or Jewel Lloyd on the backside for an open three or an, an opportunity to throw it back, find a mismatch, throw it back and attack again? So, you know, ball screens have become a staple in our offense will continue to become a, like more of a staple because sometimes simplicity for us is better. Sometimes just spacing your shooters, giving Jewel the ball with our big setting a ball screen, putting pressure on the rim allows us to initiate what we want, even, maybe even get a quick bucket, but um, initiate what we want and then get our, our ball movement started. Well, WNBA, NBA, Europe, uh, just so many teams doing a great job creatively creating that single side tag that you talked about. And uh, it's really fun to watch because that has definitely been an evolution in basketball over the last few years. And you guys do a tremendous job. And at least in case somebody doesn't know who Stewie is, Brianna Stewart, one of the iconic players in the WNBA, just have to throw that in there just in case. But coach, another thing I love the, the single double action. So there's there's an option to come off a single side or a double side, or sometimes they come off a triple. Man, your players do such a great job of creating separation on the catch. So they arrive alone so often. Can you talk about that concept of how you get them to arrive alone? Yeah, definitely. I think, you know, it becomes these actions are for you to score, for you to go get a bucket. So we're not going to run a floppy action right after saying a single side, but single double action for you to just come off and think next action, or I'm going to just grab it and get into a ball screen or step up. No, you're coming off to be a threat initially. That's first and foremost. And then the other aspect of it is the screening. Well, before the screening, I would say the read. So giving, giving let's just use Jewel Lloyd, the ability to come off a single side or a double side and understand if, if they're chasing you, go ahead and curl it. If they're locking, if they're um, shooting the gap, go ahead and flare it. And that allows her to then be a playmaker from that standpoint. And then the, the other aspect that comes into it is the screening. The way in which we screen, how we screen, headhunting and finding bodies, that sets up our shooter um, even more because now they're coming off wide open as opposed to not getting any hits at all and having to just settle for our next action. Well, and below that floppy single double action, you can see your players too also use change of change of pace, change of direction, the run, stop, run type of concepts, all these different subtleties, but also, and I want you to talk about this, the screeners, how if they see the defender lock and trail or chasing that the screeners moving to make that defender have to go wider to create more space. And if they're going on the inside, they're moving in to make the defender have to go farther around such subtleties of offense, isn't it? Yes, definitely. Such so subtleties. And, and one thing to understand too, when you've created some space, so maybe I fake like I was going one side and I'm going the opposite side, players are more inclined to shoot the gap when they're late. So when you understand as a screener that, okay, Jewel has now her player is lost, let me move up a little bit. Let me move in a little bit because this player is not going to no longer lock and trail her. They're going to shoot the gap, trying to 
because they're late, they're trying to get to where Jules gonna go. Now I'm gonna adjust my screen and now Jules gonna be even more open because we're gonna make that read. So def de definitely little subtleties, you, you, you alluded to it, the, st the stop and start. Jewel is great at that. It it you know you draw foul sometimes or it just keeps the defense off balance. So another thing that I noticed that I'm a huge fan on, and we've never talked about it on the podcast, is this concept of screen backs, where somebody attacks baseline. You know whether it's rejecting a ball screen or you set up some type of ISO attack, and then someone screens back for someone coming behind them. And it's not just a fill, it's actually they're getting a screen to come back behind. And wow, you guys have some great actions out of that too. Yeah, you know, I do have to shout out Pokey Chapman used that action a lot a while ago. Um, Stephanie White also used that. I remember it was called, their, their action was called <laughs> Too White. But yeah, we, we like to create a lot of misdirection um, and a lot of opportunity, just, just create it creatively screening and getting our players open and so that's one thing i find that is you think about putting pressure at the rim right driving baseline to create the space a lot of players drop to the level of the ball but so they're leaving the top space open and so we're you know we're cracking back we call it crack back action crack back to go screen away for our shooter and from that you have a plethora of, of, of options you might slip it, um, you might come off, rescreen it. So there are a lot of things, but you gotta, you, you know, you think about defensive concepts and, you know, how to be creative offensively, knowing what you do, what you're supposed to do on defense, which is right. Drop to level the ball, help the helper, um, but it leaves the, the top kind of open. Per synergy, number one in transition. And um, I'm curious with that then, I mean, obviously we can say it's personnel and it's true, it's true. But what are some things that uh, have, have made your transition more effective in your opinion? Yeah, I think first and foremost, it's important to know is when you want to play our offense, you have to be in shape, you know? So we're constantly trying to run and practice and trying to build that stamina up. We prided ourselves on like in the fourth quarter, teams are going to be tired and it's, a, it's going to be the long game with us. And we're going to always win the long game because we have that stamina, we have that pace. And so in transition, it becomes just running your lane hard, running it hard, running it often and early. Kicking the ball ahead is huge. Uh, we like to run quick drag screens, just getting into actions faster, quicker, so that the defense cannot set up. And, and then another thing that is important to know is efficiency in what you do. So you can have a, a lot of options to run fast break, but if you're not taking quality shots, then it means nothing. So I think I think we, we get the shots, but we also make sure we're taking quality shots. Now we do have some great shot makers that take tough shots. But as far as just running your lanes hard, trying to, you know, be unselfish, find the open man, get to the rim early and often, um, make plays quick, early, efficient, pass up an okay shot to get a better shot, to get a great shot. And that pace and that flow that that comes with that, um, I think gives us some quick, easy buckets. And I'm curious, you know, I think people are getting the impression you guys were good in offense, uh, number two ranked offense overall, number one in transition. And uh, I'm wondering, do you have any analytics or metrics that you like to follow for gauging your success? I do. Um, I like to look at, this is just me, I think, being a former like point guard. I like to look at our assist to turnover ratio after off that. Like when I look on the um, stat sheet and I see, oh, we're only at seven assists or at 10 even, I'm like, ah, uh, our offense, that, that gives me an indication of what we're doing offensively. When we're at 25, 30 at something, like that's where we want to operate in. And that's when I know that ball's moving or, and this is the next set I look at, then we're hitting shots um, because we're getting good looks. We're getting, you know, we're, we're getting our comfortable looks, our rhythm looks. We like to shoot the three ball a lot, a whole lot, um, because we have, the person now to do that. And so, you know, yeah, I, I do understand our, our, our overall field goal percentage is important, but how much, how many threes are we shooting and how efficiently are we shooting those threes? Because that's just who we are. Offensively, just those are probably the, the, the two that I, I kind of look at the most. Like how it, it gives me indication on our ball movement. Um, and it, it gives me indication of our efficiency. 
And uh, we, we talked about some of these actions that you run and we talked about some of the, the transition and some of the different concepts. So uh, maybe give us an idea of how you practice some of these phases of the game. Uh, is it is it 5 on 0, 5 on 5, drills, small sided games? What are the ways that you develop these concepts that have been successful for your teams? Um, definitely a lot of 5 on 0 in transition. So I'll give you one drill specifically because I brought up the fact that we like to flow after our initial. We will, you know, transition, we'll have like about three up and downs, but we will, we won't shoot till under seven on the shot clock. So it, it is a conditioner drill because you're constantly moving. It is a reminder of your spacing, but it is also showing you that you can do a lot of different actions within a 24 second shot clock and still within seven seconds, run a ball screen and get an efficient shot. Now, do we want to play that slow? No, not really sometimes, but it, it is like, it gives you, it, it gets your mind, it gets your body moving, moving, and it gets your mind adjusted to playing faster, playing in constant movement, but also playing within the structure of what we like to do with spacing and how we move and when to move and things of that nature. So there's some chemistry involved in that, um, but also it's, it becomes a, a drill that is three, four, very simple, but three up and backs flowing and not shooting until under seven, it becomes a condition. Yeah, so you're making a transition drill actually have to flow into concepts and flow and conceptual offense. That's great. So it's great for you to share that. Thank you. Wondering then, obviously, a developing coach who's already had the incredible experiences as a player and with some mentors and coaching, uh, where do you feel that your greatest area for growth is moving into your next season? I think I have honestly used this offseason to tackle how I can be better from a leadership standpoint. So I went to North Carolina to talk to Kara Lawson. I went to the Bay to talk to Steve Kerr. I went to Portland to talk to Chauncey Phillips. Um, I went to South Carolina to talk to Don Staley. I, again, you know, it's twofold because I'm scouting as well, but selfishly, I wanted to <laughs> talk to these great minds to, to get tidbits that I need that would help me on this journey, and, and and if you think about it, this, is my first full year with the training camp. Uh, sorry, with free agency, a training camp, a draft, and the season. So my philosophy going into the off season was like, okay, I want to talk to all these great coaches and leaders and take notes, and then develop something that is mine and that I can like stand firm in. And within that, I would say for me. My evolution is just getting well versed in, you know, the the nuances of offenses that I like or like offenses in Europe, offenses in the NBA. And how can I now find to that for the Seattle Storm? Like that that has been my challenge. And then from a leadership standpoint, how can I continue to be confident and strong, prepared and strategic? with our roster that we have, but also now in a leadership role that I am now like standing firm in and feeling confident in and knowing that it's mine and it's solely mine right now. I mean, I have a, I'm starting fresh. So just, just being more, more just confident, I think, in everything that I do, knowing that I put the work in in the off season. I've talked to all these people, I'm studying, I'm constantly watching, I'm constantly learning. And I just want to gathered all the information that I've learned, poured into the players, into our system, into our organization, and, and that be like the seeds for me. Coach, this has been so fun. I, I've really enjoyed getting to know you and, uh, you know, learning more and, you know, the WNBA and the league and all the great players and coaches. I mean, it's just so fun to watch. And uh, thanks for taking the time to be able to share the game with us. Thank you for having me so much. I've enjoyed our conversation. Hopefully I've been a light and enlightened others and, and created some more Seattle Storm fans. Of course you have. <laughs>